Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today I've got some special musical guests, Big Little Lions. They're going to help me with the song. And together we're going to interview a lawyer who's devoted her life to fighting for justice in America. She's the co-director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions, co-host of the Wrongful Conviction podcast, and uh, was featured in Netflix's Making a Murderer series. Let me introduce you to Laura Nyride. So I'm Jack, who we were emailing. You can see from my, nice my name you, there. And uh, yes. this is Paul and Helen. <laughs> you're all in different places, so you're pointing. Yeah. I know, you're, you're pointing a completely oh, yeah. different Wait. place. <laughs> Helen's over That's, there. But it's, Paul's over there. It's very nice okay. to meet all of you. I'm Laura. Nice to meet you. We are all literally in nice different places. Paul is in Ohio. Is that right? Yeah, and um, uh, Helen is in uh, Vancouver Island, and I'm in Italy. And where are you? I'm in Chicago. Chicago. Oh, right. yes, yes. Just up the street. Yes. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, great. We've driven by Chicago many times. <laughs> well, we've we spent... played in Chicago. Didn't oh, we? we have. Yes, we yeah. did. We did. Yeah. See, tell, so are you a band? Tell me a little bit more. I'm, I'm, I love the concept of your podcast. And I just am curious how it came about and, you know, the genesis of it. Sure. Well, I'm, um, I'm the host every week. And every week I have guest musicians to come on and make it sound much better. So we have uh, <laughs> these guys that come on, Big Little Lions, and uh, they're going to help make the song. Big Little Lions. And you, a different band every week, is that yeah. right? The musicians every week. Yeah. Big Little Lions, that's really great. Can I find your, your music on Spotify if I look? You can. Amazing. We've got, we're releasing a, something new each month. So if you're desperate for new music. I, you know, well, I'm a music person. <laughs> the, um, what kind of music is it? Kind of folk pop. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Um, Pretty palatable. <laughs> our, uh, the podcast we have on wrongful convictions is executive mm. produced by Jason Flom, who is a longtime music executive. So, oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Nice. That's, it's a fun space to be in. And I am always looking for new music. So exciting. Sure. Can't wait to hear your stuff. Well, well, we're a band from afar. So we didn't really think the pandemic thing through when we, <laughs> we decided, decided to do that. So, that, is that right? You record from all, all these different locations? Well, no, Paul's in Ohio, I'm in Vancouver Island. We got together just to, to record for music for TV and film, which we still do. Mm -hmm. But then we ended up being a band and touring, which is... Uh... Yeah, one, so year we have ago, we, one year ago, we played our last show, mm -hmm. live show. Where were you? Yep. Mm -hmm. We were in BC, Centra, B yeah. into, into interior BC, and then Paul's I like, ah, a, I think I need to go home. I got an <laughs> early flight home, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for about 150 bucks from, from <laughs> oh, Vancouver to Cincinnati, and I was like, "Yeah, I got to go back." Yeah, so. of course, and you know, maybe one day there's some hope on the horizon, just starting to form. Yeah, I mean, for us it'll be a while because obviously we can't be in, we're not in the same country. But, Helen, yeah. you thought we'd be back in Toronto by May of that year. I really yeah. did. Oh <laughs> well. <laughs> do you do most of your touring? How did I? In What's that? Do you do most of your touring in Canada, or are you, are you everywhere? Canada and the States. We were supposed to be in England actually now, uh, oh. but obviously that's been that's been postponed to next year. So <laughs> hopefully, <shut> down. <laughs> yeah, hopefully next year we'll be yeah. in England. Lovely, we'll see. lovely, great. And how's this lockdown be for you? How has it affected you? Oh, you know, well, I mean, it's just been about a year for all of us, hasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I have to say, well, it. <laughs> I'm one of the sort of fortunate ones in that this co the lockdown coincided perfectly with the release of two seasons of our podcast, the first two seasons um, of our podcast on wrongful convictions, which of course I do here in my closet, in my guest bedroom, in my house. Right? <laughs> um, so being forced to be at home and cut out the extra commute time actually gave me a lot of extra time to work on the podcast, which is um, pretty successful. We hit number one on the U S charts, which is exciting. Wow, nice. Yeah, Totally, you know, shocking the hell out of us. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, COVID, wow. it's like you attribute it to COVID craziness. I don't know uh, that people wanted to listen, but um, that's great. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's been nice in that way that it was sort of that additional time to focus on on creating content. But it's been hard, you know. I've got two little kids and homeschooling, and 
Oh man, that's how. You know, so well, yeah. both of you, both of you being podcasters, how often do you do a new podcast? So our release schedule, we did two seasons, um, twelve episodes each. So and one episode okay. a week. So it is pretty pretty intense. Now we're gearing up for a third season. I'm just t- trying to find the sort of shreds of will left that I can <laughs> sweep. Yeah, but it's also quite sad, isn't yeah. it? There's so many wrongful convictions that you've got enough material. I think you've done 200 episodes now. It's insane. Wow. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. The number of of wrongful convictions there are. Sadly, there is way, 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 way too much material for this. Uh, for this type of story yeah it's kind of it's it's yeah it's horrible to say it's good for the podcast but not not good for the world well i mean one of the exciting things about our podcast wrongful conviction um and the different podcasts that air on that network is that we really do believe in driving change with these stories right so we have these stories because we all in our different ways work on these cases we know the people that it's happened to you know we know all of the players in all of these different cases and and being lawyers or advocates who've worked on these cases for years and years and years because sometimes these cases take years and years and years you get to know the system really intimately and where it fails and in so many of these cases it's failed not just at one moment but at several points along the road and um you know what we do when we tell these stories is we take the opportunity to really drive a campaign for change that's been very successful we've been um, working a lot on new laws that govern the interrogation room and that govern um, the way that kids are represented, right? Most In most states in the United States, kids are not allowed, or kids are allowed to give up their right to lawyers in the interrogation room. And that's something we're trying to fix um, among a lot of other how do you um, How do you not take that home with you? Oh, I take it home with me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you let, is there, a, is there a way that you can let it go so you can, be with your kids and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's I get asked that question a lot and I never have a very good answer to it because the answer is that I do take it home with me, right? These cases, they're not just cases, right? My clients are people that I know for 10 years, sometimes 12 years, 15 years, because that can be how long it takes. And you don't just yeah. know your clients, but you you know their, their mom and dad and their family members and their friends mm-hmm. and the people who believe in them and the people who support them, right? I mean, my client, Brendan Dassey, who is in the Netflix series Making a Murderer. I've known him since he was 17 years old and he's in his 30s now. So I have literally watched him grow up. So I have to take him home with me. He's yeah. almost like a, yeah. a child of mine at this point or you know a, a nephew or something like that. So, you know some- You know that's even better to hit, it's probably better to hit like that than oh I I cut off and right. I can separate because- you're probably a disassociative disso- right. type of person. You know in a way that that I find harder to to understand how I would do that. You know, because these kids yeah. they just get inside you, you know, they just get inside you. The people get inside you and and you can't set it down. And I don't think you should set it down. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. How did you get? Well, I listened to. Sorry, sorry go, ahead, go, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> well, I hope they have a good question. Well, I listened, <laughs> I listened to the Jordan Harbinger podcast this morning. I run with you on it. I don't know how long ago that was, but you were talking about how states were trying to. Uh, they're trying to get compensation for these people that get out yeah. uh, after wrong. Yeah. Is that improved any? Is that gotten better over? I was just on Jordan's podcast a couple of months ago. I think it came out. In okay. So, that's- so status quo. I think Idaho just became, what is it? The 37th state, something like that to pass a law, um, allowing exonerees to get some compensation. Um, yeah. So it is not yet all 50 states. but And of course, the problem is when you look at these different state laws, even the states that do allow for compensation, it is pitifully small sometimes in, in yeah. some states, right? Um, you know, you'll be on death row for 20 years. And when it finally comes out that you're innocent, the state will say, we're really sorry. Here's $500,000. And that, I think, is the clearest illustration of how there's just a fundamental devaluing of human life that's part of this problem um, that we yeah. see in the criminal justice system, right? I mean, lives are worth more than that. Years are worth more than that. The losses, the trauma, the tragedy of, of going through wrongful conviction is worth sort of an undefinable amount of money. Enough that you Uh-oh. never have to... Yeah, it should be enough that you never have to worry about anything ever again financially because you are owed that. You are owed that. I, I agree with that. 100% you are owed that. Um, of course, that's not enough in and of itself, too, because you still have the no. pain and the trauma and everything else that you have to contend with. 
But, you know, when you think about... But at least you could do that in comfort. At least you can do it in comfort. If you think about the way our, you know, our civil legal system compensates mm. people for all kinds of harms and wrongs, um, you know, it's, it's a start that we really need to be doing for these, these folks who are coming out of prison. It's an important start. So was it the Brendan yeah. Dassey case that first got you involved in this? Yes, <laughs> actually it was. Um, so this is a story that I love to tell because it's a story that I think it turns out a lot of folks can relate to. Um, I first became involved in wrongful conviction work about 13 or 14 years ago when I was a student, a law student at Northwestern University School of Law here in Chicago. I was in my last year of law school and I thought I had my life completely figured out, right? I thought I was gonna be a business lawyer, the kind of lawyer that writes contracts and sues people when the contracts fall apart and all that stuff. I had a job lined up after graduation, everything was great, I knew what I was gonna do. And my last year of law school, on a total whim, I decided to sign up for a class on wrongful convictions taught by Steve Drizzen. I knew nothing about the criminal justice system. I knew nothing about wrongful convictions. I knew certainly nothing about false confessions, which is now my area of expertise. I just signed up for this class, complete blank slate. Um, this was 2007. It just so happened to be about four months after Brandon Dassey had been convicted of the rape and murder of Teresa Halbach in Wisconsin. And unbeknownst to me, Steve, my then professor, now colleague, had just agreed to take Brendan's case on appeal, to represent Brendan on appeal. And um, a few weeks into the fall semester, Steve called me into his office and he said, I've just gotten involved in this case out of Wisconsin involving a 16-year-old teenager with intellectual limitations who confessed to a crime that I don't think he committed. And he handed me the interrogation videos of Brendan Dassey, right? The same videos that, unbeknownst to us, 10 years later, would end up in making a murderer. And he told me to go home and watch them. So I go home, you know, this is 13 years ago, so I have them all on DVDs, right? I sit down on my couch with my laptop, I pop these DVDs in, and I watch them all from start to finish. And my heart broke because I saw these two adult seasoned detectives manipulating a scared 16-year-old special education student into confessing to a murder that he couldn't even describe. And I knew I couldn't walk away, right? It was one of those those moments, Helen. It's like it, it felt wrong to set it down. Um, and that was it for me. I graduated from law school, but no more business law plans. I decided to come back only a few months after graduation and work alongside Steve to build the Center on Wrongful Convictions, where we have represented Brendan and many, many others just like him ever since. Mm. And is it false convictions? Oh, I'm glad you did. Is it false, con false confessions that is a big part of it then in every case or? False confessions is uh, my area of expertise, one of my areas of expertise and Steve's as well. So false confessions are, I mean, this fascinating <laughs> counterintuitive phenomenon right? And nobody understands why someone would confess to a crime they didn't commit. We all think, of course, I would never do that. That makes no sense. But in fact, it happens so much more often than we understand, right? We know of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases in which somebody has confessed to a brutal crime, right? They're convicted on the basis of that confession. They're sentenced to decades behind bars. And then sooner or later, an organization like the Center on Wrongful Convictions or the Innocence Project comes along, does DNA testing, proves the confession false beyond the shadow of a doubt, right? Scientific proof. Um, and we know the person was innocent. We know the confession was false. This happens so much more often than we ever realized. And we're still learning about this phenomenon because it's only with the relatively recent development of DNA technology that we realized this happened in the first place, right? So all of a sudden there's this like groundswell of information. We're seeing confessions being proven false by DNA and we're seeing laws suddenly sweep the country, requiring interrogations to be electronically recorded from start to finish. This is a new thing. Only 27 states require electronic recording of interrogations. So it's like this combination where all of a sudden we can prove confessions false with DNA, and then we can go back and actually watch the interrogation that produced this false confession, that, that made this 
innocent person in his or her right mind, not always, lim- you know, intellectually limited, not always young, not always particularly vulnerable. What could cause this person to do this incredibly counterintuitive thing? And we have all this new information and we spend a lot of time watching those videos, looking for commonalities, looking for patterns and thinking about ways to, to solve this problem. Wow. And I guess we all think that we, we wouldn't, but in reality, well, we all would, wouldn't we? You don't think you would, and but when you're young, like when you, in a small way, when you first start driving, and you get pulled over for your first ticket, mm-hmm. just think of how nervous mm-hmm. you are when you first have that cop on your tail, and all of a sudden you have this guilty conscience, and you are just, I remember just sweaty palms, and you know, then he pulls you over, and then you're like trying to figure out what to do, and you what know, it say. just, mm-hmm. and that's just a, a speeding ticket. I can't imagine being in a a small room with, you know, two officials. Well, that's now just some. I, I just thought it was something interesting because I never worried when I was pulled over by police because I'm a short, young-looking woman, and I, 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 I this is the only advantage we have as women to go. Oh, I'm really sorry. <laughs> you know, if we're gonna get all the all the bad stuff, we got to have the good stuff too. So I never worried because because I, I was white and because I was little and looked young, and I'm wondering. Is it mainly men that are being falsely convicted or is it a lot of women too? No, a lot of women too. A lot of women oh, too. Wow. It's really, really interesting. There are different sort of themes that are used during interrogation for men and women. We, we, we do see that. But but what's fascinating to me is I, I do like the analogy of being pulled over by, by a cop you know, when, you're, when you're driving because how many of us have thought, I'll just talk to this guy and I'll explain it. And everybody, and, you know, and, and he'll understand that I'm a good person and this will all just, I'll be able to sort of take care of this, right? Um, you know, we have in the United States, Miranda rights, right? These rights that we're all familiar with from TV. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to a lawyer before being questioned. Um, 85% of people waive their Miranda rights, Right. They don't understand in the moment how exactly a lawyer can help me. How fast is he or she going to get here? What what are they going to do for me? Whose side are they really on? 85% of people waive those Miranda rights. And the numbers get way higher when you're talking about innocent people. Because, of course, if you're innocent, you've got nothing to hide. Sure, I want to cooperate. I want to help with the investigation. You know, anything you want, right? Um, so you waive those Miranda rights at a, a staggeringly high rate if you're if you're innocent. And then comes the interrogation. And this is the part, one of the parts that really fascinates me is the psychology of the interrogation room. These are tactics, psychological tactics inside the interrogation room that were developed 70 years ago here at Northwestern University in Chicago, where I now teach, right? Before then, interrogation was mostly about physical tactics, right? That's what they used to call the third degree. You hang somebody out the window until they confess, or you slap them around until they confess. And and 70 years ago, there was these reformers here at Northwestern who said, well, let's make this more humane. Let's develop psychological techniques, right? Um, And it's those techniques that we're now only starting to understand are just as capable of causing false confessions as as beating someone until they talk, right? So these, these psychological techniques they basically work to turn the world on its head for the person being interrogated. Um, You are told that if you, that there's a ton of evidence against you, right? That no one will believe you're innocent, that you are caught, you are trapped, you are cornered. There's no way you can talk your way out of this. No one will believe in you. You've got no help on the horizon. You're absolutely going down for the rest of your life, yada, 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 right? That's the first sort of half of interrogation is reducing you down to hopelessness. And we know that during this phase of interrogation, police officers in the United States are allowed to lie about the evidence against no way. you, right? So my lab says they really? found your DNA at the scene. Totally legal. If it's a lie, doesn't matter. Totally legal, right? So, you know, you're not going to convince me that you're innocent because I found your fingerprints on the gun. Totally legal to is lie that in about all that. states. So this. In all states, absolutely. And it happens it's every, like an abuser. Day. Wow. every day. It's, it's like that gaslighting abuser. Right. That it, right. But on speed, because it's like... And, th- and think of this as you, right? You're sitting there, you're going, I've never been to this crime scene. How could my DNA be there? I've never touched this gun. How could my fingerprints be on it? But more to the point, you're thinking, there's a cop or there's three cops in my face. And boy, do they seem like they believe this. There's been some horrible yeah. mistake. I don't know what it is. 
But if they think I'm guilty, everyone is going to think I'm guilty. What am I going to do, right? This is part of this reducing down to, to hopelessness. So once you hit that, that sort of rock bottom, um, I'm never going to be able to convince them I'm innocent. There's nothing I can say to get, you know, to sort of solve this, this problem. That's when police officers are trained to offer confession as a way out. Right. Look, you know, if you just tell us what happened, people will look at you differently. If they'll look at you as a cooperator, tell us you have remorse. The judge will look at you differently that way. The jury will understand, you know, you'll be able to go get out of this room and maybe call your mom. Um, you know, you'll be able to go take a breath and sort of think about things. We just need to hear it from you. Why you did this. Explain it for us. And maybe things will get better for you. Right. That's how you get confessions. Wow. These, these are incredibly powerful tactics. Um, well, just from you saying that, I already feel guilty. <laughs> right? Like, I want to confess. This I'm is ready your moment, Paul. If you have something on your yeah. conscience, <laughs> we will look at you better if you tell us what. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I just can't imagine. I love. Uh, you know, I'm lucky. I, I didn't yeah. was never put in that positions besides the random speeding ticket. But more that was more when you're young. So I could see why they go after kids that are. Yeah. You know, after kids. Well, and it's true that kids and people with intellectual disability are more vulnerable to these tactics. They're more vulnerable in general to sort of the pressure from authority figures, manipulation, that kind of a thing. But it is also true that, you know, when you look at the annals of false confessions, all these hundreds of cases that we study uh, and that we know about, um, you know, I can name you white collar workers who have falsely confessed. I can tell you about college graduates. I can tell you about people with very high intelligence levels, right? With graduate degrees. These are really, really, really potent tactics. And, um, you know, the lesson for me is that every single one of us has our breaking point. So there are, and that's what these tactics are. So they're taught in schools that the police can go to, to learn these techniques. Yeah. So there are, um, interrogation training firms, police training firms who will, who do go all around the country to different police departments and, and train people. I've actually attended some of those interrogation trainings um, and heard these, these tactics be shown. They show videos of people doing it and the audience sort of learns how to do it. Um, I actually attended a training. This is, this will blow your mind where it wasn't police officers who were being trained to use these interrogation tactics. But I went to a training for high school principals and vice principals mm -hmm. who were being taught to use these exact tactics to question kids at their school about whatever disciplinary infractions the kids were suspected of, right? I mean, they were literally showing videos of murder interrogations to teachers for use on kids. I was there. To what end? I mean... Well, <laughs> that is a great question. I mean, at school, I get it with the police, they're looking for, they want to convict someone, but in school, to, how is that helping children? Well, I mean, we have a real problem, a growing problem in the, United, in the United States with the school to prison pipeline, right? In a lot of schools now, there are police officers stationed in the schools. A lot of these interrogations and, and interviews of kids take place in the schools. Sometimes there's a principal present. So there can be a muddying of, of the school administrators and law enforcement. And that's exactly what, what I saw at that training. Yeah. Do you think it's a, a, it's a victim of uh, having private prisons? So they, they need their quota. I think there's a lot of contributing factors to what makes the system so profoundly unjust. And yeah, private prisons are absolutely one of them. The incentives that permeate the system are, are all wrong, are all wrong, which is frankly why I'm so glad that there are folks like you and so many other people right now who are talking about the criminal justice system publicly, because that is what's going to push back, I think, and what already is is enabling pushback against a system that is really operated in the shadows for too long and that has allowed, you know, corruption and bad incentives, bad training, um, all of that stuff to flourish. But when you've got crime for profit, essentially... That yeah. just blows my mind. It blows my mind. I mean, talk about the wrong incentives. That's exactly right. But the good news is there are some um, organizations out there in law enforcement who have woken up to the problem of wrongful conviction. So these are people that we seek out on a regular basis, right? If you're a progressive prosecutor or you're a progressive law enforcement officer, um, you know, folks reach out to us all the time. Um, help us learn how to do it better? Can we can we sort of work together, study what goes wrong in wrongful convictions, maybe understand how we need to do it differently? We've actually worked very, very closely with the second largest police interrogation training firm in the country 
following making a murderer they called us up and they said we were horrified when we saw those videos of brendan being interrogated um they now use brendan's interrogation video to train police in all 50 states how not to interrogate kids but he's still in prison after so many millions of views yeah I mean. it's, it's absolutely horrific how how is he still in prison i mean how how is that allowed and uh, did they I, I didn't watch all of making a murder i thought i find those things <laughs> it just makes me so sad um so i didn't so have did they ever find the actual person who 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 was the murderer so the legal system works incredibly slowly after you've been convicted and it is geared at doing everything it can to preserve the conviction and that is true across states right that is the wow. The, the design, the intentional design of the criminal justice system is to prize finality, the finality of the conviction above almost all else. So, you know, we at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, my colleagues and I uh, have exonerated more than 40 innocent men, women and children and really secured the release of dozens more. These cases take, they can take well over a decade. They can take well over a decade. And Brendan's case, heartbreakingly, is is a great example of that um this is so they know that he didn't do it right people know that he didn't do it i think people around so the know he didn't do it the question is do the people who hold the uh, the key to his cell doors what do they and do? who holds the key to his cell doors well he has a couple of options right somebody in brendan's position um being this far along in the process has a couple of options the one person who certainly holds the key a key to his cell door is the governor of wisconsin mm -hmm. Right, the governor of Wisconsin has the ability to issue a commutation or a pardon. Right, a pardon would would th those would both achieve the same thing. Essentially, saying, "Brendan, I'm cutting short your sentence. You know, go home, go home where you belong, where the world can see you belong." Um, so that's one person who holds who holds the key, and one person who we had high hopes for at one point. You know, the governor of Wisconsin, Tony Evers, is his name. He came into office a few years ago, not through sort of normal political channels. He came to the governor's office from the State Board of Education. He's an educator. Mm -hmm. He's a teacher. And when you look at Brendan, 16 years old, special ed student, all of the accommodations that he needed, you know, this is a kid who in class, his his special education accommodation because of his, his disabilities, his accommodation was that he, he was recommended to have an adult sit next to him in class to help him understand the words that the teacher was saying to him, right? That's what he needed because of his own disabilities around processing language. You take that kid and you put him in an interrogation room, right? Four times, four interrogations over a period of 48 hours with police officers and you know, his interrogation has been studied. They were, they were hitting him with five to six questions per minute. You know, he didn't stand a chance. Frankly, it's it's a miracle that he lasted as long as he did in that interrogation room. Um, and we were very hopeful that Governor Evers would see the the absolute injustice. And you know, it doesn't take a lawyer <laughs> to see the injustice of what happened to Brendan, right? It doesn't take an expert. It takes a teacher. It takes a mom or a dad. It takes a neighbor. It takes somebody who knows someone vulnerable like Brendan. Um, or someone at least who has the heart to care about someone vulnerable like Brendan. We had very high hopes for the governor. Um, so far, those hopes haven't been realized. But we. Look I wonder how the governor decisions. justifies that in his thinking that to not after everyone after the world has seen that. Well, it's 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 a good question, and it's something that we want to work with the governor on. You know, I mean, we're not interested here in pointing fingers or in anything else what we're interested in is is just getting to the truth of the situation and getting to the justice of the situation is, is what we want to do and you know there are people you know ordinary folks around the globe who wrote him letters by the thousands urging him to grant clemency for brendan dassey we had 250 uh national experts everybody from former prosecutors to judges to psychologists um to lawyers to senators to politicians to journalists um write him letters saying that they said do you have any idea why he won't doesn't hasn't well um there it's a really good question it's a really, really he's good a politician <laughs> is that what it is does it come down to politics clemency i mean obviously yeah, well that's the thing right i mean when you're asking a governor to grant clemency it is inherently political and we'd be fooling ourselves if we if we thought otherwise but I, there are many other governors in many other states who have seen it 
as politically beneficial to do the right thing um right and and be that be that um steward of justice in your state uh that good that good keeper of justice and we're hopeful that the governor evers will you know consider that point of view for brennan you're thinking who does he owe that he's not doing (laughs) doing this is it just seems yeah like you said you know people it would be a good thing to do everyone's seen it wouldn't that be the right thing to do and the fact he's not doing the right thing yeah i don't know it would be the right thing to do Mm -hmm. i don't know what more there is to say really at the end of the day right we've there's much more to say but it is the right thing to do well with with COVID, we've seen governors do the right thing and others open back up too soon and not really (laughs) care about restrictions and the possible spread you're absolutely right each yeah. is different. Each political calculus is different. You know, Wisconsin is obviously a very deeply divided state right down the middle in terms of the political parties. Um, I'm sure those are all considerations. And, you know, for a politician, those are undoubtedly important considerations. You know, my consideration is Brendan. <laughs> and I think the world's yeah. consideration is Brendan, right? He's been in that prison cell for 14 years. Um, it's just unacceptable. 15 years, actually. 15 years now as of 15 days ago, 15 years. Uh, unacceptable is just not a strong enough word either, is it? It's just like, it's, no, it's just maddening. Un- unbelievable. It's just wrong. Mm. It is just wrong. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Well, yeah, this, this has yeah. got to be so hard on you. It's hard. It is hard, but here's what I'll say, right? I mean, obviously these are emotional cases are hard to talk about people watch shows like this and they meet brandon and they know him and they care about him but that's been part of the magic i will say of it of it too is <laughs> i went through this transformative moment alone on my couch in my living room as a law student when i watched those interrogation videos and then netflix comes along and, and making a murderer comes along a show that we never asked for or solicited right it just they showed up and started filming one day um and suddenly the world had that same transformative moment that I had, right? The world saw those same videos. And, you know, 20 million people watched that show in the United States in the first two weeks mm. alone of its release. And of course, it was released globally and absolutely lit the world on fire. I mean, all of a sudden, people were, you know, energized. They were motivated. They were disturbed by what they saw happen to Brendan. They started saying his name out loud, talking about him to their neighbors and their friends and on social media and to their local legislators and policymakers and whatever the case may be. And this 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 absolute electric jolt of electricity went around the globe for Brendan, right? The special ed kid in Wisconsin who never really had very many friends in his life. All of a sudden, the world was saying his name. And one of the things that happened after making a murderer was that people started writing Brendan letters from all across the globe, right? I mean, like by the dozens, he still to this day gets about five to 10 letters every day from countries across the globe, right? Australia, New Zealand, the UK, South America, Asia, all across the United States, all across Wisconsin. And, um, you know, he has this notebook where he keeps a list of all the different countries from which he's received mail. And he, he does his best, he keeps the letters, um, and he does his best to respond to as many as, as he can. And he's built some tremendous supportive friendships that way from people who believe deeply in him. And, you know, like I say, who know, who know someone like him. Um, and so that's been a, just an extraordinary blessing to come out of making a murder. It is deeply unjust that he is still in prison. But at least, you know, those letters are a lifeline of hope for Brandon Dassey. And they keep him fighting, Right. So that, in turn, it's easy to keep writing for someone like Brendan, right? Yeah. So I assume everything is still, the wheels are still turning for him. It's still, it's, it's still hopefully moving forward in, any, in some way. Wheels are always turning. Wheels are always turning in, in these cases, right? I mean, this is unfortunately not atypical. Mm-hmm. What happened to Brendan is not atypical. We are used to hearing about the sort of, you know, easy cases where you test the untested DNA and boom, everything is is solved but there are a lot of cases out there that take years and years and years and you know they're not very many lawyers who do this kind of work so those of us when we when we take on a client like i say it's like taking someone into your into your circle 
Um, and what about his family? Um, are they like, is it like a daily fight for them or are they just kind of leave it to you guys to help out? Does he have fam? I mean, I didn't, I don't remember his living situation. Yeah. Brendan's, have- Brendan's mom is his rock. Absolute rock. Totally, totally supportive. Right. He's got a, a very supportive family. Um, but it's been hard. You know, you mentioned COVID um, for the past year. Brendan hasn't been able to get visits at prison because of COVID, right? They've shut down all the visits. His mom, of course, for the past 15 years, 14 years until this past year, visited, you know, very, very regularly, right? Once, twice a month, perhaps even more often than that, every single month. And his prison is hours away from her home. So she, you know, they're very close. Um, he hasn't been able to see her in a year because of COVID, which has been hard. But hopefully we're wow. we're reaching an end in sight, I hope to that horrible situation. That's something that inmates, of course, all across the country have had to deal with is this increased isolation from their loved ones because of the shutdown of visits, sometimes the shutdown of phone calls because they don't want people in and out of the same little office using the same phone, right? Spreading germs that mm-hmm. way. Um, so there's been this real problem with isolation even while COVID spreads through the country and, of course, through prisons themselves. Now, I might be... I. Because I, I lived in England and I now live in Canada. So I, I, when you see somebody in prison, is it still the glass wall? Or do they get to, t- does, does he get to physically interact with his mother? Um, yes, there's not a glass wall for Brendan. No, there's not a no. glass wall. So it, it varies from prison to prison, from state to state. It can vary, right? Um, but for Brendan, he is able to do what they call contact visits. So do you think yeah. Brendan is one of the lucky ones because he had, he's had a Netflix series about him? Do you have other heartbreaking cases who who deserve publicity as well? So many, so many. Those of us who do this work, there every single case is heartbreaking in its own way because what you're seeing in all, in every one of these cases is you know an innocent person who's been locked away for decades for a crime they didn't commit, and that devastates, right? Um, but it inspires too. We like I say that the, the folks who have been through this are clients when when they finally walk out of those prison doors, right? <laughs> And you can sort of see this, whatever it may be, 15-year burden, 20-year burden, 25-year burden lifted from them. It is one of the most remarkable experiences you'll ever have in your life, ever have in your life, right? There's nothing like the feeling of seeing your client walk out of the prison doors. It's like, okay, get in the car. Let's go, 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 you know, <laughs> for something. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, get in the car. Let's get out of here, right? And then you drive. Or they change their minds. <laughs> drive from there, all right, like whatever. You know, I don't care what you forgot. We're not going back in to get it. Let's go, you know. I mean, you walk out of prison with you know, often like a grocery paper bag, right? Like the kind of paper bag, brown paper bag you get at the grocery store. And that's with your 20 years of possessions, whatever is in there. And the clothes. I thought it was crazy the story of the twelve-year-old that they said. You know, I forget his name, but it was. uh, They said he was. Well, that was bad. The cops basically told him. You know, he didn't remember because that was bad. Yeah, Uh, Michael. Michael. Oh, yeah, Michael Crocase. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. This is this California. I can't believe they'd be in front of a twelve-year-old and like really try that hard to convince convicted 12 year old it's unbelievable right this is this is for this is michael crow in california who you know he and his family were at home asleep one night and woke up to to find michael's sister um dead in her room and the police for whatever reason suspected michael who i think was 12 years old i think i think that's right and you know very close in age to his sister very close family in general brought michael in for interrogation and you can see these these videos actually they're on portions of them are on youtube there were some of the most awful instances of child abuse i have ever seen and there really is no other word for it because you've got michael in agony after you know being terrified by finding his sister dead in the family home and he's brought down to the police station and they they you know they accuse him right all these techniques i described before they accuse him we know you did this we've got evidence you did this you know etc 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 he's he's absolutely he doesn't know how to process this he's 12 he's in there alone no That's parent illegal, no huh? lawyer surely it's perfectly legal unfortunately it is it is legal absolutely and they say to my it was they say it, but they say to Michael, right? He says, he's in the room and they say to him, Michael, you don't remember what you did to your sister because essentially you have a split personality and good Michael doesn't remember what bad Michael did. So we need you to sort of pretend, pretend to us that you're bad Michael and say what you would have done if you were bad Michael, right? That's how they get this confession from this 12 year old to killing his sister, which, you know, was later proven false by DNA. 
Um, well, what led them to think that he could do this? Did he was he a troubled kid or just like in any way or things that so in in many of these cases, <laughs> the sort of triggers for interrogation, right? The reasons why cops decide to interrogate sometimes will absolutely blow your mind. So I've seen so many cases where police decide to interrogate because the person is acting what they consider to be strangely. Okay, so there's a case, I've seen cases where, you know, somebody discovers their mother's dead body, right, comes home from school, 16-year-old kid comes home from school, dis discovers his mother murdered in their home, um, completely freaks out, right, calls the cops, the cops show up, and, and the kid is so upset, so upset, and they, they think he's too upset, and then they interpret that as suspicious, mm, like yeah. over the top, right, like sort of dramatic instead of, so I've seen that. I've also seen cases where the police, you know, same scenario, right? Similar scenario. Police um, show up. You've just found a loved one killed and you're in shock and you're sort of like calm about it, right? And I've seen situations where that triggers interrogation. We thought you were too calm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's sort of these mind-blowing um, contradictions. And in fact, this is part of what police are trained to do as well right is make these kinds of snap judgments based on the way you speak the way you act the way you hold yourself the way you carry yourself the way you answer certain questions um that was part of the training that i underwent too right stuff like um you know if you if you look up and to the right it means you're lying <laughs> if you scratch your nose too much it means you're lying Right. If you if you make references to God, oh my God, I would have never done this. It means you're lying. If you say I don't recall, that means you're lying. I mean, these are this sounds comical, but this is actually what police are taught to this day in this country, and that's how. A lot so not only are you going through the grief, but you also then have to figure out what the best way to react is. Well, that's the thing. You have no idea. I mean, in that grief stricken moment, I know. No how do you you're, do you're being analyzed in this way, right? That you're you're right. being critiqued. Um, ugh. And, and we see that over and over in a lot of these cases, this sort of misreading of, of body cues, this belief that you can figure out whether someone is guilty by just how many times they but scratch it sounds their like, nose. It sounds more like a systems failure because the, the prosecutors are not helping, the, 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 the judge doesn't rule the, the, the confessions as wrong, and the, the jurors, and then the appeals thing. It sounds like a system's broken. So do you feel perhaps in your work that you're, that you're firefighting and maybe you should you know, run for politics or try and change the system? <laughs> Maybe I can run for governor of Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, no to the politics, but yes to the systems. <laughs> um, I leave I leave the politics to, to more skilled folks in that arena than me. But you're absolutely right, though. In these cases, it's not just this one moment of bad interrogation techniques being or outdated interrogation techniques being used in the in the interrogation room. It's then the judge that admits the confession. It's the law that sort of demands that the judge close his or her eyes to what happened in the interrogation room, right? It's this belief that we all have, all of us potential jury members, that if someone confesses, they must be guilty, right? That's a huge consideration here. It's defense lawyers who haven't been educated enough about false confessions, who don't understand, who don't believe their clients when they say, yeah, I, I confessed, but I'm actually innocent. You can see failures in every phase of the system. Absolutely right. So this is, you know, but that's part of the... Um, Part of the importance, I think, of wrongful conviction work, when you see these cases and these profound failures of the system, when you study these cases, it's almost like doing an MRI of, of the system or an x-ray of the whole system, right? It just lays bare. It's broken here. It's broken here. It's broken here. Um, so it's useful to, to study in that way. Wow. wow. Well, you're not inspiring me to emigrate That's to America. Crazy. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've seen witness broken systems uh, firsthand as far as my father had dementia mm -hmm. and uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, just to get him into a, the proper home, it kept coming back. You know, he doesn't meet the requirements, doesn't meet the requirements, which later we found out was he didn't have the right insurance. Yeah. You know, he didn't have expense enough insurance. And those were small for you know, compared to wrongful convictions, those were smaller wow. hoops to get through. But it just showed me how broken systems are, and how they just well, it, a lot of it comes down to money. A lot of it comes down to, uh, and, and they don't tell you that obviously. But 
you know, so there's things behind the scenes of these processes that you, you don't, uh, somebody from the outside I've heard that the senators that, in America yeah. have no motivation to change the law because if they do change the law or reform, prison reform, for example, and then somebody on their watch or because of their, their work, somebody, um, you know, d- uh, uh, commits another crime or that something bad happens, they've got a lot to lose, but very little to gain. That is a concern. It is, you know, uh, for a lot of politicians, I think, for at least some politicians, that's a concern, right? If you if you grant clemency, if you if you do these things, right, what happens if then there's a horrific crime spree later on in your state and you're viewed as soft on crime and that'll be all shoved down your throat, you know, in the next election? I would hope that we are electing leaders and I, I do think we have elected some who um, care much more about people than their own political fate. And I know that's asking a lot of, of politicians as a group. <laughs> but um, I do think there are some really important conversations that are being had out there now in the political realm that, again, when I started this work 15 years ago, would be sort of unthinkable. There are real conversations now about, for example, abolishing the death penalty, which which we still have in many states in the United States. I mean, the, the idea of Virginia, right, is, is on the very cusp of abolishing the death penalty. It is going to do it. Um, it has passed both the, the bill to abolish the death penalty there is, is um, there's no impediment to it being signed. It's going to be signed and enacted. This is a state that is, is, has been an absolutely prolific executor of people. It's one of the top states in the United States in terms of the number of people it has executed. And um, it's, you know, finally there's political will there to abolish the death penalty and it's wonderful to see it's wonderful to see we know the death penalty isn't a deterrent to crime we know it's racially biased in its application we know it's there's a degree of arbitrariness in who gets sentenced to death versus who doesn't you know if you live in a state or a county that's that's one of these sort of death uh, focused areas you're more likely to be to be sentenced to death um we know it's just a, a an unnecessary outdated expensive unfair and immoral um, system of punishment. So it's, I'm glad to see political will coalescing around that. I really am. So we're we moving in the right direction. I'm a believer in progress, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I keep having to keep having to convince my uh, my uh, 23 year old daughter because she gets she gets so down with the world. Uh, and I said, but compared to when I was born, we are. It feels like snail's pace sometimes. But we are you know, I'm allowed to get a credit card without my husband, you know. So there's little oh, things that's like right. that. That's right. <laughs> the moral arc is bending, you know. And it and it's yeah. you know, it really is. It really is. Again, I mean, it's it blows my mind because up until about five years ago, I would have you know, I go around talking about false confessions and everyone's like, Yeah, Laura, you you know, what? That's crazy. No one does that. And all of a sudden now, for the first time, people believe in it and understand wrongful convictions thanks to podcasts and, and TV shows and series and movies and all of these things songs hopefully now songs and songs exactly exactly you can join the ranks of there's some incredible songs about wrongful convictions right bob dylan's the hurricane that's the only one we could Uh, think of do you know any other songs about yeah (laughs) yeah i'm well that's a that's the like iconic one i'm gonna have to think now i can just hear it the only thing i can hear in my head right now is my colleague steve drizzen who's like a huge music fan be like laura why didn't you think of blah 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 song (laughs) uh wasn't there a wasn't there a theme song for the movie Innocent Man? With I think it was Tom Selleck or somebody like that, that was the be. star of that. Well, The Innocent Man, actually, speaking of which, um, Tommy Ward, right? This is Carl Fontenot and Tommy Ward are the two defendants in that case from Ada, Oklahoma. Um, the Center on Wrongful Convictions, which I now co-direct, represents Tommy and has for many years as well. Um, it's just another classic false confession case. This unbelievable case in which... Tommy tells the police about a dream, sort of a nightmare he had in which, you know, he, he witnessed this murder happening and they turn that dream into a confession, right? Come on, Tommy, you didn't dream that. You were, you were actually there. You were actually there, right? We've got evidence you were actually there. No one's going to believe you if you just say this was a dream, yada, yada, yada. Um, how do the cops doing that sleep at night? I don't know how you live with yourself when you're doing something knowingly. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> the crazy thing is that in at least a good chunk of these cases, the officers are doing what they were trained to do. I mean, that's what blows mm. my mind, right? Mm. That's what blows my mind is we just, you know, it's there's corruption. Yes, there is misconduct. Yes. There's also a lot of bad training out there, a lot of bad education. Um, you know, so I think if we attack from all angles, I think that's most productive here, right? 
Um, but yeah, Tommy is uh, Tommy Ward has been in prison since 1984, based on this dream confession. Oh right, the, the Netflix series The Innocent Man, which is based off John Grisham's book The Innocent Man, which is about this case, um, came out a few years ago. Since then, just this past Christmas, Christmas 2020, my colleague Greg Swigert, Tommy's lawyer at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, won Tommy's case. For the first time in 35 years, we got it was like a few days before Christmas. The court issued an order. This we are overturning this conviction. There's been misconduct. The state hid evidence of his innocence. We order him to be immediately released home a few days before Christmas, and we were so excited, and uh, his family was so excited, and Tommy was over the moon. And then the state of Oklahoma decided to file a notice of appeal, and. Um, the court said, okay, we'll keep Tommy in prison during the appeal. So he's still there as we are wow. up for this appeal, which, you know, it just goes to show you it ain't over till it's over in any of these cases. Oh. As obviously I hope he's done. friends with uh, yeah. with Morgan Freeman in there. I keep thinking of Shawshank. Totally, right? <laughs> totally. I yeah. think Shawshank too. It's one of my favorite movies. A lot of inspiration. I love that scene oh, in the role hearing with Morgan Freeman where he just says, just stamp your paper, son, and quit wasting my time. Right? Yeah. It's great. I love it. But books, <laughs> movies, yeah, Netflix there's gotta series, be a point. I mean, it's still, it's not getting results. So what can we do with a song? Maybe this will t push it over the edge. What what yeah. should we focus yeah. on? Oh, I think, <laughs> such a good question. I think, focus on the people. I mean, right? Not me, but the people who are in, in prison. That's the thing. The people who are in those cages, who have those hopes. That's the remarkable thing, to be honest, about our clients. They usually find their way to us after writing hundreds of letters <laughs> to anyone and, and everyone in the country they can think of, you know, TV shows, reporters, lawyers, prosecutors, judges, anyone who they hope and pray will listen. They spend their time just writing these handwritten letters, right? A pencil and a notebook paper and just mailing them off, mailing them off never getting a response over and over over and over and then finally someone takes their case right after years of this mm -hmm. and it's just this process i think for them then of having hope being resilient enough to withstand those years of silence before someone listens and then somehow finding a way to cling on to hope during the years long process that is to follow which may or may not be successful right um and measuring that hope, I think tempering that hope with realism, because you don't want to get your hopes too high. But then for, for the lucky ones, the ones who do get justice, that whole process for them, that the years of sending the letters out into the ether, the years of trying to keep your hope down, the years of frustrations and victories and, and having those victories snatched away, and then finally achieving the ultimate victory, right? And then that, that moment of walking out into the doors uh, out of the doors that have held you back for like Tommy maybe 35 years you know that's there are no words for that but maybe there's music for that hmm. yeah that's insane mm. I yeah. just can't imagine that you could write probably a whole bunch of songs about this <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised there's not more yeah yeah, but, yeah. But I would I would I would think you would have to be part of the song because if not for somebody like yourself, we wouldn't be aware of these cases. Well, really, we wouldn't be aware of the people that we'd be writing about. Um, maybe somewhere down the line, but if one was an extreme case like Brendan Dassey or the the guy in thirty five years, um, but there's so many more. There's so many more. There's so many more. These are the ones we know about because some filmmaker somewhere decided to get involved with their case. Right. I mean, sometimes I call Brendan the luckiest unlucky person I know <laughs> that way, you know. Um, I mean, I guess this is why where social media is a good thing, because more and more stuff is coming out. Yes. And, you know, stuff is spread quicker about, you know, things that are wrong. So, yes. yeah, for all it's for all it's bad stuff, there is definitely a lot of there's so much good. energy to fix it. There's so much energy to help people. I mean, that's really to me, it's it's a you know, it's a space I came to because of all the bad that I saw, but it's a, a space that energizes me and motiva motivates me every day because there's so much will to make it right. Yeah. Well, thank you to you and people <laughs> like you that, yeah. that that are willing to take on the emotional 
baggage of all this and you don't do feel bad work. for all the businesses no. you've let down though i mean if you're a corporate lawyer you could have done made a huge uh, with the benefit of hindsight i don't think they would have uh, wanted me <laughs> 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 but you know <laughs> others are there to fill my shoes there no i don't it would have been a very different oh is he, he... Oh. Uh oh oh we lost jack again it's still recording though is it no the recording oh, still maybe a little cat has just arrived <laughs> Good. Oh, he'll, hopefully he'll come back. True. Wait just a minute. You're amazing. You're oh amazing. God. That's just just ah yeah. oh, the fact that you're doing it with you got two. I, yeah, I've had the kids. I've done. You know, you've you're doing it with two little kids, and that ah, yeah. oh, I'd find that so hard. Oh no, it's you know, I, I don't know. But you're obviously driven. I mean, you're obviously that is just you're driven to doing it. I don't know. It's just like I say. I don't know how people can not can walk yeah. through this. I don't. You know, it's I don't know. It's it's uplifting but depressing at the same time. I don't know whether to feel I'm in the middle of emotions here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to my life. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, I I couldn't be more inspired if you. Yeah, um, same same here. You, I've got nothing, like I'm fully I'm up to max. Yeah, between listening to that podcast yeah. this morning and doing Fantastic. this, we'll check out our up. podcast on the Wrongful Conviction yeah. Podcast Network. You can hear oh, more well. stories mm -hmm. that will fire you up. You know, stories of struggle and survival and triumph because that is what we, you know fight for for our clients is that moment of triumph and there's nothing like it in this world so thank you guys so much for using your podcast to shine a light on on, on these stories on this important cause it is my absolute honor to be here we'll try and do you justice with this song Absolutely. <laughs> well said <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thanks thank laura you. thank you
Thanks for tuning in. Please rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. Go and listen to the song on Spotify, iTunes, Deezer, or at podsongs.com. And a big thanks to Paul and Helen for producing that track. If you listen really carefully, you can hear my deep backing vocals, but they, they did everything else. So great job. Go to their website, biglittlelions.com. Check out all their other music or on YouTube or also on Spotify. See you next time.